So can we have our panelists just come on up here? We're, get, we're gonna show you an excerpt from the documentary, um, Street Smarts, um, a, a little bit later in the program. Uh, we're gonna begin now with the panel, and I'll just introduce them as they're coming up here. Go ahead and take seats. Um, I'll start with uh, the man in the sandals there. Uh, David Schwarz is the winner of this year's Richard H. Driehaus Prize. Uh, when I was interviewing David for the documentary, uh, it really became very clear to me uh, that he's deeply aware of the impact that buildings and public spaces have on everyone who uses them, and that would be the clients, the occupants, even the passers-by, in other words, as they say, the active and the passive users. And he talks about this in our, in our interview with, as almost a sacred responsibility. I was actually quite moved as I interviewed him about it. Um, he also definitely doesn't like to confine himself to any particular historic style, and for that matter, even a building type. Sorry, Michael, I used the word style. Um, he, he has designed everything from opulent concert halls to hockey arenas in um, styles, forgive the term, ranging from neoclassical to art deco. Uh, and he doesn't feel obligated um, uh, by, to strictly adhere even to the, any particular language with, within a style that he chooses. In fact, uh, he said one of his favorite activities is inventing new classical orders, like the horse head column capitals at the uh, Cowgirl Museum in uh, Fort Worth. Um, he can give you a very erudite and well-defined uh, and well-defended argument for this kind of eclecticism, but he also said in our interview it was because he has a short attention span. Uh, <laughs> he, he founded David M. Schwartz Architects in 1976 in Washington, D.C. He's received his bachelor's degree from St. John's College in Maryland, master's of architecture from Yale, and he currently serves as the chairman of the Yale School of Architecture Dean's Council. And among his many built works, as has already been said, um, for the last several decades has been a literal transformation of downtown Fort Worth, Texas. And it's often said that a, any great architecture requires a great client, and David's client for that uh, decades-long project is also here on the stage with us, Edward P. Bass and members of his family. Ed's commitment to his hometown is the stuff of legend in Fort Worth. Um, the Driehaus Prize jury recognized this in 2007 by awarding him the Henry Hope Reed Award. So he is a former Henry Hope Reed laureate. One of the things we learned when we were in Fort Worth making the film is that the town is rather proud of its nickname, Cowtown. And as a measure of that, um, Ed's role as a leading citizen in Fort Worth also includes being the longtime chairman of the board of the Southwest Exposition and Livestock Show, which is widely regarded as one of the premier rodeo and livestock shows in the Western United States, and there's some clips of that in the documentary. We won't see the clip of that tonight, but if you, uh, or today, but if you watch the show, you'll see it. Um, Ed is also a committed environmentalist. He was one of the founders of Biosphere 2, which I'm sure we've all heard of, and uh, that is now actually a research facility uh, for the University of Arizona. Um, he is a graduate of Yale. He studied architecture at the Yale School of Architecture, and in 2014, Mr. Bass was awarded the Yale Medal of Honor in recognition of his ongoing service to his alma mater. Um, Dr. Richard Jackson um, is the winner of this year's Henry Hope Reed Award, so we have two Henry Hope Reed Award winners right next to each other. Um, any of us who have commuted regularly have probably said, I'm sick of this long commute. Um, Dr. Jackson's research shows, in fact, that sprawl can literally make you sick. Uh, he currently serves as professor of environmental health at the UCLA School of Public Health. Uh, he graduated from the UC San, San Francisco Medical School, and he earned his Master of Public Health from UC Berkeley. He's the co-author of the 2004 book, Urban Sprawl and Public Health. And even though he's not an architect, uh, his work has been so influential in the field of architecture um, that in 2005 he was selected to serve on the National Board of Directors of the American Institute of Architects, the AIA. And he's also a fellow public television host, so that's good. Uh, and finally, to my left, Elizabeth Plater Zyberg um, served as, as dean of the University of Miami School of Architecture for nearly two decades, 1995 to 2013. She's founder and emeritus board member of the Congress of New Urbanism. Elizabeth received her undergraduate degree in architecture and urban planning from Princeton and her master's degree in architecture from the Yale School of Architecture. You seeing a pattern here? 
Uh, she has received several honorary doctorates and numerous distinguished architecture awards, including the 2008 Driehaus Prize, so it's all Driehaus all the time up here on our panel. Elizabeth and her firm, uh, uh, DPZ, are quite famous for, among many other things, the town plan for Seaside, Florida, and we are currently, uh, at my organization, working on a new series for PBS, and one of those episodes, uh, this is a national primetime series for PBS, is called uh, 10 Towns That Changed America, and one of those is Seaside. So let's welcome our panel. Well, that's all the time we have today. So, <laughs> uh, so let me start out. Uh, I'll pose a question to you, David. Um, the centerpiece of your, and we're, we're talking, you know, we've we framed this as a conversation in large part about, about the public realm, public space. I'm sure we'll go in all kinds of directions, but let's start there. Um, uh, the centerpiece of your plan for Fort Worth isn't a building, it's a plaza, it's a public space. Um, it opened just a year and a half ago, and in our interview, um, you said that until the plaza opened, all those buildings, those dozens of buildings you've done in Fort Worth, you described as sort of words thrown on a page. And you said in the interview that um, once the plaza was there, it was like a book. The story was complete. And Ed, you can, of course, jump in on this, too. Uh, why is the plaza so important? I, I think um, downtown's folk, uh, work as a community's front porch. Um, and what we had done is built the house, but not the front porch. Um, <laughs> in order for people to see and talk to each other, they need to be sitting on the front porch. If they're squirreled away in their bedrooms, they're not going to meet each other. Um, and we were quite conscious when we did the Fort Worth plan and when we um, put, located the plaza, um, that the plaza was really the center of, of the heart of our downtown. Uh, we were very careful to balance our work east and west of the plaza, so that when we actually did put the plaza in, it was the center of downtown. So it was a very um, strategic uh, insertion of pieces over time. The other important thing, and one of the reasons the plaza came last, aside from the fact that we didn't control the whole site, um, but a very important function of its coming last was there were enough people to fill it up. Um, had it come first, it would have been one of those empty windswept plazas that we read about and hear about so frequently. So both necessity and common sense prevailed to create a very successful space. Yeah, Dave, uh, Ed, you said in the interview you were kind of naive going into this, and you said much to our delight, maybe even you said much to our surprise. surprise. <laughs> it works. Uh, I wasn't yeah, surprised we read by that. <laughs> Jane Jacobs and Holly White, and uh, we said, okay, that's what you do, and we did it. And like I say, uh, one day we stood back and said, my God, this works, you know? Uh, what, what, but how, how so? Oh, go, well, go ahead. Let me, I, I'm going to say a thing about this plaza, because for two decades, uh, prior to actually building the plaza, uh, this space was two parking lots, uh, 200 feet square, each with Main Street running down the middle. And we utilize those as a plaza. I often said they are a plaza, they just have really lousy landscaping. They have asphalt and striping and cars all day instead of pavers and fountains and, and all those usual plaza things. But we, we programmed them intensely and had everything from during the summer movie nights to uh, Main Street Arts Festival. Was this, you're uh, saying to, even when this was parking lots? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We would close Main Street and do the spaces together and we would have concerts there with, with 20,000 people in the downtown. We had all sorts of things. ESPN set up. We had boxing uh, in the middle of this. But the, the thing about this, and uh, programming is so important to public spaces. Uh, Fred Kent, you know, preaches that. Uh, and, and it's so true. And we could program those into being a plaza. But then when the event went away, they just reverted to asphalt parking lots. What's so different now having the plaza, we still can program it and do program it for many, many things. But when the event goes away, it just becomes a public space that draws people. I would say when we opened the plaza, uh, the thing that was most gratifying to me 
uh, I, I knew that David and, and our landscape uh, architect Michael Ferguson uh, did a very creative and beautiful job. But when I saw that people would come at all hours just to hang out, now that's the measure of a public space to me. Uh, it puts something into their life. It gives them uh, a type of... of um, of activity, of experience, of interaction, and that's, that's what we could not do with asphalt parking lots. You know, it, as you talk, I, I think about, you know, my, I used to live in a neighborhood in Chicago that some of you probably know called Lincoln Square, where we have a little plaza with a fountain called Giddings Plaza. Well, it actually doesn't even have a name. We all call it Giddings Plaza because of Giddings Street dead ends into it. And it was the focus of the neighborhood, and I, I used to say, wow, I just don't know another space like this in Chicago. When you travel overseas, a lot of European cities, they're all over the place. How rare are plazas in this country, public spaces like this? Liz? You're looking at me. Um, well, you know, generally speaking, they're rare because um, most of our urban places have been laid out in a speculative grid. Um, the famous grid that the new urbanists promote for its connectivity um, nevertheless is not conducive to uh, the special occasions, the dead end um, or the special corner or even a central place um, for the most part. Uh, but there are cities, even with the grid, um, which have devoted um, a special place for that public kind of central place or multiple ones. Um, and those might be our best models. So, um, I think of the Spanish settlement towns of the Southwest um, that have the central square, or uh, Savannah, of course, which is a wonderful model with its um, regular distribution of public greens. So we do have um, models for that, but we also have a, a kind of history of, of not caring about that, not paying attention mm. to it uh, in the rush to develop um, and to lay out places to um, live in or for private use, but not for shared, um, for shared space, in the, civic in the, space. In the absence of those things, much as you were describing with the parking lots, will we just kind of take some space and, and use it? Do you find that, that you know, in neighborhoods we, we, you know, if there's a vacant lot or a, a kind of a street corner that for some random reason is a little bigger, we'll actually sort of take them over and use them? Um, of course that happens and uh, uh, right now there's something called tactical urbanism where um, small groups of people take small and quick actions to bring um, uh, shared space to the public. But uh, you know, you said something very interesting which was about programming and uh, places are made by design policy and management is the trio of things that I often refer to. And management is clean and safe. We seem to take that for granted now. It wasn't always true. Um, but we do forget about programming, that actually giving people reason to come together, not just the space, uh, but things to do and ways to be together um, can be very important. And very often city revivals um, begin with programming in things like parking lots or empty streets um, to bring people back to a realization that this can be a wonderful place and that actually sharing life in public um, is an enrichment of private life. Mm -hmm. Richard, I want to bring you in on the conversation. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of laying out some thoughts and then we can go wherever we want to go with them. Um, but I want to drill down a little bit into what we heard about your work. Do you really have research that shows that bad places literally make people unhealthy? Is there a good body of research on that? I'll talk more about it in the formal session, but uh, I almost got fired in 2003. <laughs> I wrote a document for Sprawl Watch that said, the way we're building America is bad for people's health. And it just seemed, where we, I was at CDC and we would tell people, you, eat, need, you need to eat more fruits and vegetables. You eat, need to eat more sensibly. Stop eating so much fat, sugar, and salt. And then you'd go into a poor neighborhood, and all people could afford and get was fast food loaded with fat, sugar, and salt. And um, CDC was wagging our finger at people and saying, you need to walk, you need to exercise. And the numbers for physical activity were dropping. 
And I literally was sitting at David Satcher's table, he was the director of CDC, and they came in with the Surgeon General's report on physical activity. And I said, we have no right to issue this report. And the other 10 people at the huh. room became very annoyed with me. <laughs> we, the 250 pages, we've worked very hard. And I said, there is not a sidewalk within three miles of CDC in Atlanta. No one can get here by public transportation. And we inhibit and prohibit anyone from exercise in this environment. So we have no right to tell people to exercise. I just want to stay two more seconds. We've seen a 14% increase based upon 200,000 telephone interviews a year at CDC, a 14% increase in the prevalence of the symptoms of depression in our society, even controlling for the economic downturn. And we know our grandparents knew how to deal with mild to moderate depression, not severe depression. And it was being with other people, being with people who love us, being physically active, festivals. And Liz, you were talking about the importance of festivals. And um, you know, in California, we have a 1% set aside for art when a building is put in. And I was arguing we ought to have a 1% set aside for festivals because mm -hmm. you that's the software of the community, and you need to set those patterns up for people to pursue it further. Stop. Yeah, you know, that in that Giddings Plaza I was talking about in Lincoln Square, on Thursday nights, they always had some little musician would come and play. And the neighbors for blocks around all of us, we would bring our lawn chairs out. And they didn't have chairs. We'd just bring our lawn chairs out and set them up. And it was so unlike any other place I'd, I'd been. Um, David, I want to go back to asking you a question. Um, so we're stuck with the car. We have the car. Um, you, we went and for the film and visited this place that, that you have designed, um, South Lake, which is a kind of um, the develop. It's a little town. It was a shop. Was basically a shopping center, right? That no, it was a horse farm. It was a horse farm. But I mean, the the, the program that initially the client was talking about was sort of a shopping center, right? A mixed it use. A, it was big box retail, strip center, and office park. Right. And so, in the course of making this place through you, through the client. They, 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 the model that they started thinking about was the movie Back to the Future with the town square and the clock and, and a real town. And there is a town now that, that David and the developers have put together with a, with a city hall, um, residences, all of it. Um, but if you fly over it in a helicopter, it's a lot of parking. And so my question is, you know, it's, so important for us to think about and hear about these models for new urbanism or for living transit-oriented, walkable communities, but how hard is it to change the culture? I mean, do people still just basically drive to South Lake, do their shopping, and drive home? You, 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 the way you ask the question is to say that that's a bad thing. We'll pay, drive to South Lake, do X, Y, Z, P, and leave. Um, our goal, we do recognize that the car is, I don't know that it's here to stay, but it's certainly here for the foreseeable future. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that interests me most is how much car patterns have changed. Um, most of the people I know who are under 35 in Washington don't have cars. They use Uber and cars to go. Huge change in the model of automobiles, huge change, and it will change the way we build. But our goal has been to get people to use cars less. Um, it used to be in the South Lake neighborhood that you got in the car and you went to uh, get your coffee before you went to work, you got in the car again and then you drove to work, you got in the car again, you went to lunch, you got in the car again, you went back to work, you got in the car again, you went to meet friends for drinks, you got in the car again, you went to the movies, you got in the car again, you went home. Um, in, in our interview that it came up te that uh, David was told, Texans don't walk. That's correct. <laughs> I, 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 what, what they don't even use turn signals. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's quite, it, 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 it's quite true, it's quite true. In the first couple of months I was in Texas, I was in a uh, major office building downtown, one that the Bass Brothers built, and I was with a client of mine and we were having a meeting and uh, he said to me, let's go to lunch, and I said, great, let's go to lunch. We went down the lobby, he went left to go to the parking lot and I went right to go out the front door. <laughs> and he said to me, where are you going? I said, well, we're going to the Fort Worth Club, aren't we? It's just a couple of blocks. He said, yes, we're going to the Fort Worth Club, we'll drive. One of the things you need to learn is Texans don't walk. Yeah. Uh, and at that point, I said about 
my goal in life was to prove that it's not Texans who wouldn't walk, it was developers, architects, and planners who had not given Texans places worth walking. Um, and the fact that, that in downtown Fort Worth now you can't find a parking space and you see people on the street all the time is to me a, a great sign of our success. Uh, the goal is not to separate people from their cars, it's simply to get them to use them less. Uh, people can go to South Lake and they can um, do three, four, five of those tasks I just described. Same is true in Fort Worth. Uh, you can go downtown Fort Worth, have coffee or breakfast with a colleague, go to your work, go out and sit in the new square and have lunch, mm -hmm. uh, go back to work, meet your honey for uh, a drink, go shopping at any number of different stores, go to a movie, go to a concert, um, and you only have two car trips. Um, those would have been five, seven, ten car trips before. Um, and so, our, and, and to get between those activities, you do walk. Richard's point about walking around an environment, um, and you get people outside and you create a sense of community. Um, when we designed the Dallas Arena, Mark Cuban and I had a big fight as to whether uh, basketball was um, America's favorite sport. He was absolutely convinced that it was. And I kept maintaining that people watching was America's favorite sport. <laughs> Um, and he said, well, you'll never get people in the concourses during a game. And we had a bet. I said, I I'm willing to bet a sig significant sum of money on that fact. I won. Um, and I think that, you know, human beings are by nature social creatures. And built environments uh, can promote that. And I think that's the goal of our work. That's encouraging. Um, and I don't want to dwell on this. Um, it, it, but it is hard, right? It's hard, Do Dr. Jackson. It's hard to change the culture, right? No, it's not. It's not. It's absolutely not. No, it, it, it's easy to change the culture if there's a will. If you have a client like Ed Bass, it's easy to change the culture. It is economics, tax policy, um, and vested interest that makes it hard. If you actually have the will, it's not hard. Hmm. My friend Howie Frumkin, co-author, said that public health has been remarkably successful We've convinced people to eat less red meat, stop, stop smoking, um, get a colonoscopy, and wear a condom. So in, in public health, <laughs> but we, and seat what, belts. And seat belts. But what often usually works is starting with the young. It's very hard to change the behaviors of a 45 mm -hmm. or of 60 year old. Young people, and you've all seen this over and over again, have taught their parents about recycling, about not littering, and. Um, and even with changing the diet and moving to a diet that's much more fruits and vegetables is good for you, what we found is you couldn't start with the 12th graders, you had to start with the first graders, next year it was the third graders, and the year after the fifth graders, but you had to move it up. But culture does change, and, and you wouldn't believe it if you went back 20 years and you saw everybody smoking at every restaurant you went yeah. into. It's funny, isn't it? I mean, it's hard to even remember those days when, you know, the people were out at their desks smoking in I the office. I told one of my sons, oh, when you were a little boy, we went back to see the family in New Jersey and they stuck us in smoking. And he goes, Dad, they didn't smoke on airplanes. He thought I was the most ridiculous man in the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, another, uh, another aspect of this, um, the way this discussion um, was framed um, uh, with Michael's help, uh, has to do with local character and, um, you know, seaside, you know, uh, very much um, set out to um, be uh, designed along the guidelines of, of, of historic southern towns, is the quote from your website. Uh, we talk about Sundance Square in the documentary and, 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 and um, Fort Worth generally is a red brick city. And so there's a lot of emphasis on red brick. Um, why is that important? Why is local character important? Or is it? Well, you know, um, Michael Lacutis, I think, said it beautifully this morning when he mentioned um, the character of certain cities. And you called out a number of cities that immediately we could imagine what those places are like. And um, the majority of our surroundings are universal. Um, and in fact, there is. Um, a whole um, line of thought and goals in architectural work um, and urbanism, which are universal, which are saying, isn't it great? We can all do the same thing everywhere, and all the materials are, are available everywhere, and indeed, you know, marble flies around the world to get to buildings in other places. Um, but character is ever more elusive, I think, especially local character, and um, Aldo Rossi said character was derived from the history and geography 
of a place. And there are many things under those two words, um, the traditions of building, the inaugural efforts that dealt with the materials of the place. And the geography understands um, that larger picture of the region as well as how the building fits into that. Um, and that is a, there was a group of architects in Belgium, later in Portland, and it, I think, <clears throat> diffused among many of us this idea that you would understand what the region is like um, and then what the city is like and what the street should be like before you designed the individual building, such that the individual building was, you might call it a fractal of that, or somehow embodied the place in a way that would be um, indelible and um, could never be confused with when any other place. But, you know, it used to be that you would travel, I'm old enough that when I traveled to Europe as a young person, people were still dressing differently in different parts of Europe. The college kids in Italy look different than the young people in Paris. Um, and that's not true anymore. Uh, everybody the worldwide now has access to everything. Um, and, and we're all the same. And so this issue of character of place um, is so valuable because it really has to be um, intended. And, and I should say saved. One of the great things about these awards is that preservation is front and center. Um, and that preservation war is not won uh, in terms of character of place, and it just is something that we need to keep attending to. What does character of place do for us? I think it, it, um, uh, it gives, it's part of our personal identity um, or our understanding of the identity of another group of people in another place. Um, you understand where you're from, how you can be different among um, millions of population, how you can make individual contributions when you see others um, making their individual contributions. So I think it's, it has a very important, um, very important contribution to personal well-being. I think it's really much more simple than that. I, I'm happy to admit I have a short attention span, but we all do. <laughs> And one of the great advantages of differentiating a place is that when you get bored of one place, you go to another. Um, and we, we all like difference. We all like to go somewhere other than we are. We all have short attention spans. There are different degrees of short. So it's rejuvenating. Mine is particularly short. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it is different to go to a small town in a big city. Um, and I think we all want to have vibrant and different experiences. And, you know, I, I think the best example of, of what's happening to us is retail. Um, you see the same stores everywhere. Yeah. Um, and it used to be that you could find this cute little shop that sold X, Y, Z, P, or Q. Not true anymore. Uh, How do you deal with that? Because when we looked at a lot of your towns, it's, you know, um, Panera and Starbucks. I mean, the clients who are going to move into these places, Banana Republic, are the national chain. So how do you deal with that as an artist? Well, you know, it's much better than it's going to be. Um, it's going to get worse than it currently is. All of you all of us increase our online shopping. And with each increase in online shopping, bricks and mortar stores are going away. And there's going to come a point where there is nothing to put in our downtowns. There is nothing to put in those places we occupy except restaurants and bars. You can't order them on the internet. Um, and I think that it's really important if we really care about the quality of our cities, if we care about the quality of our experiences, that we look at how society as a whole is driving us to really boring places and homogenous places. I'm going to disagree a little bit, which is that Travel, Good. Travel and Leisure did a rating of the best places to visit, and one of the scales was what was the prevalence of non-franchise restaurants and services. All right. And the fewer oh, no, we're the non franchise the happier people were in that kind of place. And you architects use a term that I love, which is a place ought to be legible. And there's, you asked me about data, and I didn't really get to it, but there's very good data justifying a lot of this. Design a place people walk better, they give them a farmer's market, they eat better, and the, the data's there now. It wasn't there 10, 15 years ago. Um, no, no, the point I was making, I totally agree with that. Yeah. I, I think that it is the homogenization of us that is a bad thing. I think what's really, we need to be thinking about is that online retailing is going to destroy retailing. Um, and at that point, cities are, and towns are going to become very different places. You know, we, we it, have an approach to that, though. I wanted to ask you, as a developer, in in Fort Worth, uh, 
Sundance Square has a brilliant, just wonderful guy that's the CEO. And, uh, and you should we, say Sundance Square is not just the plaza. Sundance Square is a district. Right, it's a whole Actually, area around the plaza. it was a district the before there was ever a square. And in fact, we call it the Sundance Square Plaza. Uh, but everybody calls it Sundance Square. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, we have a strategy recognizing that. And we have been working for uh, almost a decade, and now we're getting real traction to create a fashion district soft goods, because you can't try on a dress online. Mm. And it's a different type of, uh, of, of shopping experience. Now, all of, all of the stores that we're now attracting and opening up that we have, uh, you can find you know, four or five of each, each store somewhere in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex usually that you would drive to and it's in some sort of a center, et cetera, et cetera. What we have is a pedestrian experience that ties in with that, that fashion experience. Uh, and it's walkable. It's a tiny little miniature Michigan Avenue. Uh, but Michigan Avenue, uh, Online will never replace Michigan uh, Avenue, Fifth uh, Avenue, uh, uh, and I so forth. I don't think it's so much, you know, it's interesting. My understanding of this comes from working for developers. And what developers will tell you is how much the demand for retail space is going down. Hmm. Um, and that I think places that exist <clears throat> have a huge trump card over places that don't or need to grow. But if you talk to a, you know, a, a Neiman Marcus, for example, or a Nordstrom's, they're not building new stores. Um, and they're not building new stores because their primary, primary competition is online. But let me, let me take this somewhere else, which is the That's direction I was coming <laughs> from, which is that um, sometimes there's a need for people to have the store, to be the store. And in fact, that's part of public life. That's part of way, right. the way people make a living. Um, and there are a lot of retailers, local people, who whether it's a restaurant or something else, are stuck in a shopping center somewhere out along a highway. And they are the people who are often the happiest to come into if they are allowed by the developer into the new places such as you and we make, David. Um, and we have wonderful stories of the Greek restaurant that was out there on the strip. And then when they moved into the new town center, they decided they would live above the restaurant. And you know, it's a family business. It can, it can work financially because they're all in one place. Um, and you know they can take care of the baby upstairs while they're cooking downstairs or whatever's whatever happens in that and they become part of the community and it's a it's a different approach to retail which I think will always um, have a place while the convenience of the internet may be driving the big picture there's always going to be the local picture well, it, it, and it has to do with the need of the people to run those places. And I think what's really important is, is and I said this, said this intentionally for all of these people in the room, is if you want bookstores, go buy your books on stores. Don't buy them on Amazon online. Um, I love bookstores. Um, so more and more, I try and buy my books in a bookstore. We just had this problem downtown Fort Worth. Our bookstore closed. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, it is a loss. Um, and our bookstore closed because everybody's buying their books online. So if you want bookstores, you got to shop in them. And our strategy is in that space is going H and M, right? Fashion retailers. So. Uh huh. Uh huh. <coughs> I, I, I want to oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. No, if you. Well, I was going to say something about another type of public space, uh, and it is a a market. I'm going to call it marketplace space. And you go to you, you know, you go to you can go to Europe. You can go to uh, places in Asia and you can learn in true traditional cities and so forth and uh, if you take if you take uh, the souk or the bazaar the grand bazaar in in Istanbul is a place where all order of uh, retail goes on and the families uh, that own and operate the shops and all the people that come there uh, it provides a place for interaction, for, to, to, uh, for energy, uh, and so forth uh, within that retail experience. 
or there's in Aix-en-Provence, there's a fabulous market that's open every morning from about six o'clock till uh, 11 or 12 o'clock. Uh, that that if when you go in town in the morning to do your various shopping, there's a few things. You know, it's a it, it sells everything, but it you go there for uh, vegetables and and uh, you can go there for bread, you can go there for so forth. And it's, it's so much a part of the fabric of the social life of that town. And somebody's uh, programming it, somebody's organizing it. Well, it, I think it, tradition has organized it and the city regulates it, but it's been there forever. It's been there for centuries. And, and, and you compare that with the experience of doing your shopping in a Walmart uh, or a, a, a supermarket or, or whatever else, where you get very little out of it except the goods. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, so right, there's I think, more it, to I it think than for just developers, the goods. I think for architects and so forth, to finding ways to create these experiences, and they, often it's through events, it's not all the time, but a weekly, a weekly public market. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the best that I know, Aspen, uh, every Saturday morning, just closes a few streets and there's this fabulous public market and all these people come in and set up their booths and have their wares and You're their You're saying foods. this is an Aspen? Aspen. Yeah, call and, it. And all it is is a couple of public streets. There's no architecture involved. Mm -hmm. uh, but opportunities for that to turn the retail experience into a, uh, a really energizing social experience is something I think we can, we can, we should all look for. And and if you want to have a great time traveling, uh, don't just go to the museums. Go find those marketplaces and experience those. Well, this conversation has been so great uh, that I've gotten completely absorbed in it. The guy who was giving me my time cues has left his post and given up on me. So. Uh, <laughs> I think we've, we've, uh, we, we've exhausted the time that we have, but I'd like to give you each an opportunity, if you'd like, to give us a, any summation or final <laughs> comment that you might have been itching to get in and jump in and say before I just, we all get hustled off the stage. Any, anyone have a, a final thought? When they look at big political shifts and other shifts, cultural shifts in a society, it looks like you need about 7%. And it turns out this is probably about how many birds in a flock need to move in one direction. And the entire flock begins to change. And it's true with wildebeests and other creatures. And the shelf life of human beings is very short. And when I look at the 7% of our young people, they're very bright. They're so hungry for authenticity and for reality. And uh, they're very original and very creative, whether it's food or clothing or anything else. And I think that's architects build for 20 years and 40 years from now. They don't necessarily build for tomorrow. Or you should build for the long term. And I, I think this is, uh, it's easy to get discouraged. And I think that we're looking at a cultural change that could be very positive for health and happiness and maybe even social and political participation. I'd like to follow up on that, and that I think it's easy to blame everybody else for all that happens. Um, my point to all of you is if you want nice stores, go shop. Um, <laughs> when Bass Hall was finished, um, I remember Ed and I were at its opening, and I, I said part of my remarks when it opened was, if you want this concert hall, buy tickets. Um, you can't expect institutions to work without your participation. In the end, it's all up to you. And you have to be the participants that, you're the actors on the stage. We can build the stage, but you guys are the actors on the stage. That's a great final comment. Let's thank our panel.